Hey everyone, you're listening to the Simple Electronics Podcast. I'm your host, Dan, from the Simple Electronics YouTube channel. And this episode is brought to you by PCBWay, but more about them a little bit later on. Today, I have no guest whatsoever, and um, I've got a good reason. Um, I've, I've been busy. Actually, the biggest reason that I haven't been reaching out so much is that about a week ago, I hurt my back pretty badly. Um, it's still uh, in a state of disrepair at the moment, uh, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the show. And so um, really, if you want to be a good help, uh, if you want to be on the Simple Electronics podcast as a guest, or if you have uh, connections with someone that um, you think would want to be on the Simple Electronics podcast as a guest, have them reach out to me at dan at simpleelectronics.ca. That's dan at simpleelectronics.ca. At the moment, I am the most interested in uh, content creators. Uh, I am also very interested in people who teach electronics or programming, uh, people who run or have contributed to open source uh, software and, and or hardware projects, and um, people who just have uh, cool stuff to show off um, or specialized expertise in certain fields. It's kind of like a broad spectrum. So essentially, if, uh, if you have anything that's worth talking about, um, which it probably is, and you're probably judging yourself too harshly, then reach out and uh, I'll have you on. Um, the problem is when I send out emails and DMs and stuff like that, well, a lot of it gets caught in spam filters, especially if I send links to the show, you know, so I can show who I am. Uh, often those things get, get caught in the spam filter or creators are really busy. So yeah, if you've got an in on someone who you think would be interested on coming into the show, reach out to them and have them reach out to me. But just because I have nobody special on the show today doesn't mean I have nothing special planned. So one of my big things is I love helping people, but I am not uh, an electronics or an electrical engineer. I also don't have the, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years of experience in the field like someone like Big Clive would have. So what I've done is I've gone to um, Reddit slash r slash ask electronics and i have picked a couple of posts that have questions asked that have either one or no replies to and my plan is to read them out live to you and uh and answer it in the best way i can answer it and then pause the recording since i'm by myself i can do that and then go type out the answer and then on to the next one. And I'll also put the link to the post that I'm replying to down in the description. So if you think you can help the person uh, with a better answer than I can, or if you just want to add your two cents, you can just go into that link and you can add your own responses. So let's get started here. So the first one up here is going to be pushing my reading comprehension skills to the limit. Uh, so it says, good morning with Halloween coming up. I have a personal project I wanted to seek help with. I have this these pumpkins that light up with LEDs. They require three AAA batteries, so around 4.5 volts DC to work. And my thought is, why? what if I rig this thing so it becomes solar powered? This way I wouldn't have to bother with buying batteries every three days. That's, that's my number one hint. This is going to be a little difficult. And if I add a photo sensor, I can make it so they light up at sundown. Well, I have an idea of what I want, I, uh, of what I want, and what I sort of would need. I wanted the input of the community in regards to what considerations I should have in mind, such as the size of the solar panel cells and the wattage output requirements in terms of milliamp hours. How would I have to assemble the parts for them to work properly, etc.? Would anyone be willing to helping me figure out the right way? or to steer me into the right path and get the system figured out. I'm not looking to hook them all up to a single panel, just sort of make an over-glorified garden light like those you see at Walmart for a dollar. It's obviously not going to be a dollar, but I'm not looking to break the bank and burn 80 bucks either. 
At that point, I'd just get the flame light bulbs from Walmart, put them on a timer, and ran them inside the pumpkins. Thanks in advance. Okay, so I'm going to assume that this person wants to do a little bit of a DIY. So what I would do in, in, in my particular case is I would point them towards a couple of people who've done experiments with the X5252 uh, solar power chip. I've got some here in stock because I'm trying to remember, I think it was one circuit, Anthony over there, uh, who has experimented with the X5252. And I know Big Clive has done a whole bunch of work with the X5252 just on disassembling things and modifying uh, solar lights and stuff. Essentially, the big issue that I see with this particular poster is that they're saying it requires three AAA batteries, so four and a half volts DC. So that voltage is a little bit high, but if they say that it drains batteries every three days, those LEDs are far too bright and far too powerful to work particularly well in a solar light. You'll charge your battery sort of uh, during the day, and then it'll only last an hour or two after sundown, and then you know, you've got nothing for the rest. So. I would definitely point this poster to take a look at the X5252 circuits and see if they feel like building their own. But failing that, um, you can go to the dollar store or Walmart, uh, those kinds of places, and you buy the solar lamps directly and you disassemble them because they come with the solar panel, the X5252 circuit with the day-night circuit as well. I think it, I believe it just takes the... Um, the input from the solar uh, panel to tell if it's day or night. And it comes with the LED and it comes with the with the battery, it comes with everything you need. And I would just transplant that circuit into the pumpkins. Um, so I think that's the most cost effective way. But yeah, other than that, um, solar cells are kind of pricey. So you kind of got to be careful a little bit on that one. But um, yeah, that that's my two cents on that. What, what do you guys think? got that answer all typed up uh let's check number two um oh oh how do i do this previous oh okay so the title is need help i want to put a charging module and lithium battery at the back question mark this is my schematic and pcb layout all components is in the front the back is reserved for battery to put on and there's no other details. There's just that. And there's two images. One is a schematic. Uh, essentially, it's a Wemos D1 Mini. And there is a WS2812 breakout module. And a um, SSD 1306 or 1308 LED display. Uh, looks like just an I2C display. And the next image is the PCB. It just looks like a, you know, like a gum stick shaped uh, PCB with a Wemos D1, uh, three buttons, the OLED and a WS28112. And I guess he just wants to put a charging module and a lithium battery on the back. I'm not sure what the question is. Oh, sorry. This is by user uh, Cy Palace Palace. And the previous one was by user national frame 2670 so um i would say i've done a lot of these kinds of um uh, of pcbs of just combining uh different modules onto pcbs uh, just to tidy up the wiring and make it make it look a lot cleaner um, however for this person i am not sure what exactly their requirements are. They didn't leave a lot of details. Um, but I would say to just go with a pre-made uh, TP4056 uh, charging module, pop it on the back, uh, connect the 5 volt in to the uh, like 5 volt of the Wemos D1. So when you plug in the Wemos, it'll charge the same thing. Uh, and then the output, I would put it on to you know, the 3.3 volt line or something like that after a regulator. I mean, the thing is, his his PCB is just combining modules. And so uh, I would say um, either go for a TP4056 sort of pre-made module with battery protection 
or uh, get a power bank uh, PCB because the power bank PCB uh, deals with the boost up to five volts immediately. So as soon as you turn it on, it'll have five volts. So I don't know what the question is here specifically, but I would say um, he should look into some uh, power bank PCBs because he can attach a uh, cell onto that. It usually has protection. It deals with charging, discharging, and it also deals with boosting up the voltage to five volts. So that's what I would say to that one. All right, so who's my next victim? Next victim is Tiefliger. T-I-E-F League. Er, spelled a little weird. Um, this is an interesting one. So why does this capacitive touch sensor plus LED module use two transistors to turn on an LED strip? The module is supposed to recognize touch and then turn on an attached LED strip. Okay. Uh, and then they provided a photo of the, uh, of the board, which is annotated. There's some jumpers for the power supply, jumpers for the LED strip, uh, two transistors, Q2 and Q3, uh, which are exactly the same, uh, J3Y and SOT uh, 223 uh, footprint, side by side, and a capacitive sensor. And he writes, hey guys, fairly new to electronics and circuit design and first time poster. I'm trying to understand this touch LED module. As far as I'm getting it, we're using the TTP223 capacitive sensor to turn on an LED strip. The part I'm not getting is why it's using two J3Y transistors to turn on the LEDs. Wouldn't one transistor be enough? Please enlighten me. Thank you in advance. Okay. So let me try to, you should go check out the post in the, uh, in the, in the description, but I'm going to try to write a word picture for you here. So there are two transistors, uh, sitting in the same orientation. Okay. So you've got two legs towards the bottom, one leg towards the top on both of them. And it looks like, um, the top leg is coming from sort of like it is connected to the, the positive. Uh, on one uh, transistor and the top leg is coming towards as uh, on the other transistor is going towards the negative leg of the second uh, of the of the LED sorry and it looks like the bottom right and the bottom left legs of two separate transistors are touching each other so the way I am interpreting this is five volts or whatever, 12 volts or whatever voltage is coming in to the top leg of one transistor, leaving the bottom, entering the bottom of the next transistor, and then out the top of that one. I believe these two transistors are in a um, Darlington pair, or they're set up in a in, as a Darlington pair transistors. So I am presuming that the... Um, essentially that the voltage coming out of the TP223 uh, touch sensor is not, or sorry, the current coming out of the TTP223 touch sensor is not enough to uh, fully saturate the base of one transistor. And so basically they're using that one to turn on and deliver enough current to the second transistor for the second transistor to be able to deliver all of the current available to the LED strip. So that, that's my assumption. My assumption is to keep the current down on the TTP223 or, or simply because the TTP223 is not able to provide enough current to yeah, fully allow the transistor to, um, to, to be fully on to fully allow enough current to pass. That, that, is, my, that is my assumption. And just looking up uh, J3Y, uh, it's telling me that um, the two legs side by side are base and emitter, and then the leg on top is the collector. So, uh, so if I am not mistaken, that would mean that the circuit would work. Let's see, collector, emitter, and then base then collector emitter. Yeah. I, I would say 
that is uh, that is probably what is happening here. Is that the looks like there's a five volt regulator that is uh, that that is powering this whole thing. I believe they are set up in a Darlington pair. That that is my guess. Um, obviously, I'd have to dissect the circuit, and I'm more of someone who learns by physically doing, so I would have to probe it myself, but I would assume that's what it is, a Darlington pair in order to allow more current to flow. There we go, answered that guy, and I also added uh, a little bit of information that I just thought of while I was typing on that one. Uh, first of all, I think you see a far, like fewer of the Darlington pairs uh, set up or even the all-in-one package Darlington transistors because we now have high current MOSFETs that are relatively inexpensive. But the little board in the image that he provided really seemed like it was like for a cheapy little very inexpensive device. And so uh, at that level, when you're manufacturing millions of these things, um, you know, and, and very likely it's for a consumer product that is sold in the millions, um, it's probably cheaper to use two cheaper transistors than one uh, higher current MOSFET. And so that's probably why they're there. So I added that. I also linked the person to the Wikipedia article on Darlington transistors because Wikipedia can explain things way better than I can. So there we go. That one is done. What's the next one? Next one is by Zouch. Z-A-U-T-H, T-C-H. Um, beginner LED kit, question mark. I'm a beginner model builder. The model I'm working on has a lantern that would be great with a red LED. I'm excited to learn some very basic wiring as I've never done any electronics before. Is there a beginner LED kit, preferably on Amazon, that includes everything I need? I don't require any special effects or anything. Just need it to be red, battery powered, and able to be turned on or off. Well, I will tell you, um, you just need three things, uh, four things. Let's let's just say, for an LED project, you need an LED, you need a resistor, uh, you need a, a source of power, and you need a switch. That is it. The rest of those details will depend on. Like, what kind of envelope does it need to fit in? So if you have a very small light, you may need a very small LED. If you have access to only one and a half volts, like a AA cell, then you may need some sort of, uh, you know, a voltage booster or something like that for your LED. But for the most part, uh, something that you're going to buy on Amazon, just a basic electronics kit will kind of give you everything but you're going to be limited because those electronics kits on Amazon are really meant to be breadboarded. And the envelope of your design will be more limiting to you. So I would say um, go on Amazon and get an assortment of LEDs, an assortment of uh, thin, very thin gauge wire. You won't need very thick at all if you're doing LEDs. Like something like 30 gauge is probably fine. An assortment of resistors uh, and an assortment of switches. You know, so because you have to order four or you know four different orders, you have to do four different orders, kind of four different products. It is going to add up in price. So the alternative to that is to go on AliExpress um, because then you can just pay like a dollar for like a hundred LEDs and then you'll pay like two dollars for like you know 30 feet of uh, 30 gauge wire and then you'll pay uh, you know a couple bucks for for like a thousand switches you know so you get all those parts uh, much cheaper but you know when you go on Amazon they they kind of have to amortize the cost of those small components you know over a large range so yeah, my answer is a, is a bit more complex maybe than this person wanted, but I think it's it's valid. I mean, when you're wanting to buy electronics, you kind of have to buy, or components, I should say, you kind of have to buy in bulk. You don't really have a choice because no one's out here wanting to pay, you know, uh, credit card processing fees on 10 cents worth of LEDs, right? So... 
yeah, I'm gonna offer as much advice as I can, and uh, I'll let, I'll fill you guys in if my my answer to them becomes more complex than what we're just talking about here. Well, that was a heck of a reply. Um, it uh, it dawns on me that when you when you're not sure of someone's comprehension levels, uh, or if they're self described as they're completely new, uh, you do have to put a lot of details. So the answer is quite verbose, uh, so so that they really get you know a good information out of it. Um, this does make me think I need to make a basic how to use LEDs type video because it would be a lot easier to link that video to people um, because this person had posted six hours ago about the basics of how to use LEDs in their projects and nobody's even answered them. So yeah, I, I'm glad I got to, uh, I'm glad I got to, to respond to them, but yeah, I've gave them a whole bunch of information and I did recommend uh, at the end, I told them that everything is available on uh, Amazon, but uh, to check out AliExpress because when you're buying components, it's a much better deal to buy them from AliExpress. You just need to be a little bit more patient. That's all. So uh, next one is by Marsupial Do eight five nine two. The title is Project Ideas. A uh, person says, "I am a junior in electrical engineering." and looking for project ideas I can work on. I'm involved in clubs and stuff like that, but wanted for some time now to do something on my own. I've been thinking about designing a PCB. I also have a 3D printer for any parts I might need. Any suggestions for a project that ties these two together or helps me build new skills? Well, junior in electrical engineering. So this person is probably like 18, maybe 19 years old. So that's good. I would say to make a project like a um, like, like a useless box. I don't, I don't remember a useless machine, useless robot, useless machine. Let me let me look this up here. Yeah, useless machine or useless box. So that's a box where uh, you flip a switch and then a little arm comes up and uh, opens the lid and flips the switch off and then returns to zero. So this is a great project to uh, test out, you know, your design skills because uh, you need to design the box. You need to design a little arm. Uh, you get to make a little PCB. You get to work with a microcontroller and a servo and stuff like that. So, so I think that's pretty nice. And on top of that, it makes a nice desk toy. Uh, and it really gives you a sense of like, I finished something. So... That would be my recommendation for PCB and 3D printer combined. Um, otherwise, you can, you know, your, your imagination is kind of the limit. Like you can make stuff that, um, that you can make like a step counter that you clip onto your belt. And you just use a MEMS gyro and some programming. But that's, again, that's programming. What really is something that is kind of like electronics specific that also uses 3d printing that's kind of a, a tough one it really is a tough one because i'm trying to think of one that would require uh less coding skills like something more like component level electronics oh a little guitar amplifier so there is one you can make a little um, a little amplifier, guitar amplifier that that you clip onto your belt, and then you can take input from either a guitar or a microphone. And uh, yeah, it should be fairly simple to make a you know an op amp type design. There's designs available everywhere, and you get to try out your creativity. You can make a box as simple as you want or not. So yeah, those are my two options. I would say a a uh, little guitar amplifier slash, you know, regular amplifier uh, or the useless boxer slash useless machine. I, th I think these two, that's what I would recommend. One of those two. So it looks like I've got two more tabs that I have selected for this. But before we go on, I just want to thank the sponsor of this episode, PCBWay, as usual. Um, PCBWay is a manufacturer of PCBs. You can get um, 10 boards, you know, up to, uh, I think it's a, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters and it only costs you five bucks plus shipping and handling uh, shipping and handling uh, is available in, on the slowest 
uh, speeds for a very reasonable cost and like courier, you know, two, three days for uh, quite a bit more, but still reasonable. I think it was like 20 bucks to get it to Canada. And uh, just uh, just to let you know, you can't get anything in Canada for 20 bucks from that part of the world. So it's very reasonable. Um, they also do things like 3D printing, sheet metal work, um, injection molding. They do CNC, all sorts of things. That stuff is all very cool. But the most important thing is that PCBWay is investing in the maker community. You'll probably see a lot of creators on YouTube are sponsored by PCBWay. And that's not for no reason. It is a direct investment into the community. There's a lot of channels I know that wouldn't be around without them. So I think that's good enough reason to give them a try. And if not, well, just give them a try because they make great PCBs. So check the link in the description and go support them because they support us. All right. Who is next on the chopping block? Is my Arduino Nano good? I'm just a beginner in soldering and I mistakenly solder the middle bottom pins the wrong way as I thought it's just like an ESP. Uh, okay. Let me open the image. Uh, okay. So I see an Arduino Nano. I'm not, I'm failing to see what's wrong with, oh, I see the, uh, the, the, the communications uh, port. What, what's that called? ICSP uh, header. The six pins in, in the middle um, that you would connect to a programmer or something. He soldered them facing the breadboard, essentially. So, yeah, I think he's perfectly fine, though. So I think the only thing is it's going to be difficult for him to plug it into a breadboard. It won't, he won't be able to plug it into a breadboard, essentially. But I think that's no big deal. Um, I personally would probably just desolder them and leave them off. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, just think of it as soldering practice because it's, uh, it's perfectly fine. It just won't fit in a breadboard. Now, alternatively, you can get uh, female pin headers uh, and pop them onto your male pin headers and then pop the, the, you know, the male ends of those pin headers into your, into your breadboard. But it, that really depends on the quality of your breadboard. So personally, I would either desolder though that uh, the accidental headers, or I would just snip them off. I'd, they're not really needed unless you're doing something very specific. And at that point, you can just resolder some new ones on. No big deal. All right. And the last one here is from independent underscore neat underscore 441 is need help connecting LEDs to a power source. And these are three watt cool white high power cob LEDs. And their description is, I'm very much new to this and I know it's very basic. Yeah, don't worry. We were all there. I need to connect around 25 of these three watts to a plug outlet. I know I should use a voltage regulator slash resistors, but I don't know much about these. I could use a five volt charger adapter to connect to the power source, the wall plug. Would much appreciate if someone could help me. Um, okay, so this one's a little bit different um, because someone came uh, and gave some help. So uh, Marius HM uh, actually replied, the first one of these that actually have a reply, and he says, uh, LEDs are current-driven devices. The voltage on them is just the voltage from which point they start to produce light. But once they produce light, you need to have a circuit, limit the current, otherwise they'll burn themselves out. And then he goes through this whole process. Actually, it's a it's a really detailed post. So I really need to get on to making a video and a website article to to explain this stuff. But my immediate uh, concern is that he wants to run twenty five of these to a plug outlet. So how would I approach that? Well, the forward voltage of these things are probably going to be in the three. 3 volt range. I think the 3 watt ones are just a single uh, LED, maybe a couple of them in, in parallel. Um, but they can be problematic because 25 times 3, that's 75 watts of power. And he's going to have to dissipate some of that current through a current limiting resistor or 
he can use a uh, regulated power supply. So if I'm looking on Amazon here, let me go amazon.com. I probably won't answer this one because someone did a really good job, but uh, so five volt uh, power supply. Let me just see here. So you can get for, looks like $26, maybe a little bit less. You can get a five volt power supply with a little uh, voltage adjust potentiometer. And so in principle, you can run 25 of these in parallel and simply drop the voltage to a, a level at which it won't allow too much current to pass. I've done voltage control on LEDs before, but my concern would be in the long term. I'd really like some uh, current limiting resistors on that, but it, that's just not really feasible because your current limiting resistor, if you're if you're running you know enough current for a three watt LED, it's going to have to be a fairly big resistor. So you're really going to want a three watt LED driver, or or just yeah, a LED driver in gen in general. I don't actually know what the requirements for this project is. I have to assume that there is a more efficient way to do this than to than to just want to power 25 of these 3 watt LEDs. So actually I think I may want to answer this person and, and ask them what their use is, like what what their use case is. Because I almost feel like they bought the LEDs or are planning to buy the LEDs, but maybe there's a an LED better suited to their use. For example, if you just want to light uh, a, a zone, right? If you just want a, a single point of light, let's say they, they want to stack all 25 of these back to back to back all beside each other and, you know, light up whatever, a room. Well, I would probably say that a cob, a larger cob that uses a higher voltage single cob would probably be the better solution to that. You put it on a single heat sink and you use a single LED driver. But running uh, running a lot of these little ones kind of makes me wonder. Like I almost feel like this person is building like an aquarium light or something like that uh, because I've been there. I've, uh, I've wanted to do the exact same thing. But I just don't think they know how much you know, how much they're biting off here and, and how much they're, they're really willing to chew because that can be a big deal. Um, LEDs can vary from one to the other. And just because you put them all in parallel doesn't mean they're all going to be happy in parallel. So yeah, I, I've done it before where I've had quite a few LEDs and I've simply put them in parallel and I've voltage controlled them and I've voltage con controlled up to, I think, five in a single bank. And that did work uh, relatively long term. That's how I used to light up my YouTube videos at the very start. But I don't know if that's the best practice. And without knowing the use case for these LEDs, I would be remiss to try to, um, you know, come up with a solution. So maybe that is going to be my reply on this one. As I'm going to reply, I'm going to ask them what their use case is, uh, because really without knowing the use case, there may not be a correct answer. What, what do you guys think about this one? This is going to be an interesting one. So there you have it. I uh, went by and answered, I think it was six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, posts on Ask Electronics that had no replies or uh, one that had one reply, which was actually really good. Um, but I, I think it's our duty uh, as people who have learned from places like uh, Reddit and YouTube to uh, to go and give others a hand who just want to come into the uh, hobby. The hobby will never grow. It'll never stay alive if we don't invite uh, newcomers in with open arms. And I understand that some of these questions are very basic and can, uh, and can be found with a little bit of basic searching, but it's really daunting when you enter a new hobby, a new trade, a new profession. So try to put yourself in in their shoes. Um, when someone 
doesn't even know what kind of question to ask to get the answer that they need, um, in that case, it is not easily searched, right? Um, right now, I believe that that things like ChatGPT and AI in general is uh, a lot more helpful for newcomers because it it allows you to it sort of makes sense of uh, of of the gibberish that someone who is new uh, really can is the only thing they can use right to describe their thing. And ChatGPT is very good at interpreting that gibberish into being like, oh, this is what you mean, right? Whereas a straight uh, YouTube or Google search often doesn't come up with those answers on the first or second search. And when you're a newbie and you don't really know what you're looking for, um, finding out how to refine your searches when your first couple don't work because you don't know which direction to refine, it can be really daunting. So I really feel for these people I mean, I still struggle with uh, coding on a nearly daily basis at this point. And if it wasn't for really kind people, like uh, specifically another maker, which I uh, annoy the snot out of probably, but he would never say that because he's a nice guy. Um, you know, if it wasn't for those kinds of people taking my questions, my gibberish of a question and being like, oh, it seems like you're trying to figure out X. Well, here's resources. If it wasn't for those kinds of people, I would never be able to code anything. And so, yeah, I'm trying to be the change I want to see in the world. So hopefully you guys are the same with that. And, you know, this brings me to another point why I absolutely hate Discord. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Um, these questions now are being asked in Discords. And so um, when you're complaining that a newbie isn't searching properly... Um, you can basically forget it. Discord is absolute nightmare uh, fuel to, to be able to search. You cannot search them, first of all, externally. So you have to know of the existence of a Discord that will you know, answer technical questions like that. But on top of that, you, you have to engage. You have to go in and engage and ask the question. Uh, you can't do research by yourself when it comes to Discord because... Uh, the search features are absolutely horrid in there. And it's everything is is like written conversation style. So everything is one on top of the other. Uh, and so it is not indexable by search, uh, search engines. It, it is actually hell. So I think um, if anything is going to kill hobbies or, you know, niche interests or, or whatever, it's the advent of Discord because it is not indexable by search engine and um, whatever AI purchases the rights to Discord's um, uh, chat logs, which Discord definitely keeps, you know, if you don't believe me, just look at the historical chats all the way up to the beginning. It's all available there. Um, well, whoever, whatever AI purchases that data will, you know, they'll have a really good, model to work off of, but it'll all be on the backs of the people who made those Discord posts in the first place. So they're not going to see a penny for their effort, whereas Discord itself is just, you know, probably going to sign a multi-billion dollar deal. So yeah, a little bit sour on the rise of Discord and, and how Discord is being used, but it, it is what it is. I mean, that's just my boomer opinion, I suppose. But enough with that. Let's uh, let's do a little bit of a personal update. Um, what's going on in my life before I sign off for the night and uh, edit this episode? So yeah, I, uh, I I pretty severely hurt my back the other day. So last Wednesday, um, I was uh, working at a municipality that we have a contract with. Uh, essentially, they're a recycling site, and uh, people who live in the municipality can bring in uh, used tires, like destroyed tires, and the tires go into a pile, and then a recycler comes and makes uh, products out of those tires. Uh, however, you can also bring back uh, tires that are still on rims, like, like car rims, truck rims, stuff like that. So we have a contract to remove the rims, uh, remove the tires from the rims, uh, throw the tires into the recycle pile and throw the rims into a metal recycling pile uh, where then it gets uh, sent out to a recycling plant itself. 
So um, my boss has made some improvements to our machine that we use to do this. It's essentially a modified uh, log splitter off of Facebook Marketplace, which uh, my boss has welded and and added stuff to and modified stuff. He's done quite a bit of quite a bit of modifications to it. And so now what it does is you can imagine a log splitter, but instead of splitting a log, it crushes the rim inside the tire. And if you crush it uh, the right way in enough ways, you can lift the tire off and then you, you, know, you throw the tire into one pile, you throw the rim into another. Well, because of the most recent modifications to that machine, the machine was going like a hot dam. It was working amazingly. Um, and so we cleared... Uh, we, we cleared over 300 wheels in like record time, but that took a toll because I was the one tossing the metal rims and my boss was tossing the, uh, the, the uh, tires. And I guess I twisted when I threw or something and it just something shot up my back and like tightened the muscles to have like a, a, a tightened grip. And I was, you know, my back was essentially seized at that point. Thankfully we had done, uh, most of the work for the day. Uh, so, and the drive home didn't help either. All the bumpy roads out where I was. Um, I was basically useless for an entire day. Uh, the next day I had to, well, I ordered a back brace to try to make things better. Um, I, I took meds, uh, you know, over the counter stuff. And so I'm able to go on my regular teaching job. Uh, that's another update. I got a just a small one week long contract three well three one two three four classes worth so that that's nice so I'm able to do that uh, but my back still today is quite fragile so I can't really I'm not very mobile I can't move as much I can't pick up anything uh, for fear of of pulling it way worse again I am working again on Friday but not uh, de-rimming rims. We're doing a little bit lighter duty work, so I, I feel like I'm up for that. So that was good. I did even I even went fishing two days after the back incident, but essentially my boss came out fishing with me with his son, and, uh, and I asked them to do the lifting, like putting the electric motor onto the boat and stuff, and I had already um, left my battery in my boat so I didn't have to lift that or anything like that. And I installed a hitch on my car. So I was able to launch the, launch the boat with the car. So all that stuff is all good. Um, but yeah, I can't do any heavy lifting for a while. And since I'm really uncomfortable and I have kind of some heavy equipment on my workbench, I wasn't able to clear off my workbench and do live streams. So that was, uh, that, that's a bit rough. And, uh, I'm hoping that next week I'll be back to normal, but who knows? I mean, it's hard to tell with my back. Some mornings I wake up and it feels a bit better. Some mornings it feels a bit worse. So yeah, really crappy on that end. So as far as YouTube is concerned, well, nothing much has changed from our chat from last week. I mean, I still have the same things on the workbench. Like, for example, I have that Fluke 8000A multimeter that I've yet to do a uh, test and teardown of. So that should be coming pretty soon. I mean, this week, I know for a fact uh, I have the, the college stuff to do. So it won't be this week, but uh, maybe this weekend or early next week. That is the plan. I still have uh, the op amp PCBs here already populated, ready to go. Uh, in fact, uh, on my last live stream, we worked out the details on how to get it working. So those are all working now, uh, which is great. So I just need to do the production of the video. I still have two Unity devices to do a review on. And uh, a couple of uh, sponsors have contacted me wanting to send me test gear, which I was more than happy to oblige. Uh, however, I haven't heard anything from them. So um, they have my details. They have my address. They, well, at least my PO box address. Uh, they have uh, everything else. Uh, they just haven't really sent anything out yet or gave me any notice that anything is sent out. Um, but if that, uh, if that goes well, then I'll have some cool stuff to take a look at. Some really unique stuff that I've never seen any um, reviews of or anything like that of yet. So it's kind of like some brand new 
cutting edge stuff. Some of it is like test gear, like like very much, uh, you know, electronics -y. Other things are just like cool electronics that are sort of new on the scene. I don't really want to say what it is because uh, I haven't gotten it yet, so nothing is for sure. But uh, definitely, it, it's, I mean, I found it, it was pretty cool and I told them to uh, go ahead and send it. So let's see if they actually sent it. Who knows? Sometimes companies take forever to send you stuff. On the other front, um, been getting a lot of sponsorship emails for like weird stuff. Like, you know, I was talking a little while ago that someone wanted to me to review like a like a shoe tree or whatever, like a shoe rack thing. Well, I mean, that seems to have increased. Uh, in fact, I'm going to um, I'm just going to check my emails really quick. Um, you know, it's no good when it ends up straight in the spam, but sometimes it goes right to the main inbox. Um, let's see. So, uh, oh yeah, someone's trying to sell me a growth strategy. He's on email number four, and when I don't reply, he just keeps uh, sending emails. Um, there's a there's an ask for me to review costume jewelry. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't accept that one. Um, some solar lights. Now the solar lights actually not too bad. I probably would take a look at them. Um, but the these people are like, oh, um, we also need exclusive rights to use your video in exchange for our like ten dollar solar lights. So we own the content and uh, and you you will do them to our specifications. And it's like, uh, no, no, thank you. I mean, I could just order your stuff off Amazon anyways, right? So that was a no on that front. I did also reach out to a couple of companies to see if they'll send me some test gear to uh, test against the Unity stuff. Uh, a lot of people are interested in a comparison on like some of Sigilant's, Sigilant, Sigilant's stuff, but uh, they don't seem interested at all in, um, in sending me test gear, which is fine. And I'm not about to spend... Uh, you know, a ton of money to get another five and a half digit uh, multimeter. I just got my very first one here. Let me just see if uh, if if I can check uh, locally how much it would cost for a five and a half digit uh, Sigilant uh, multimeter. Let's see, eight hundred dollars on Amazon, uh, Canadian, of course. So it's not not quite the same. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a lot of money to spend just to make one comparison video, which will give me about, uh, I don't know, $5 in ad revenue, something like that. So probably not the best. I'm, I'm going to check actually the Unity video, the, uh, the scope one. It did pretty well. I'm just going to check how many views and how much money I earned on that one. So content... And so I got 6,449 uh, views on that one. And if I check the analytics, I have earned $14. Actually, that's really high. Typically, it's like half that. So $14 in ad revenue for the roughly like eight hours all in of like filming and editing and thumbnailing and all that stuff. So... Yeah, I, I'm I'm rich, folks. <laughs> That's how it goes. That's what YouTube is. Uh, so yeah, I I made it. Yeah, really, quite a bit of uh, uh of RPM. Uh, so revenue per thousand. It's uh, I oh, know it's low. What? It's uh two dollars and twenty two cents per thousand. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Cause I got six thousand. So yeah, it's not. I mean, you don't make. YouTube videos to get rich, especially not in a niche within a niche that is the electronics world, right? I was uh, more than happy to to get the test gear to use and to test and to update my stuff and uh, make some cool videos, even though my back's not allowing me to make videos at the moment. That stuff is all coming down the pipeline. Oh, yeah, and I'm still planning on making, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this actually, but uh, I'm still planning on making the uh, 
completely AI generated project uh, idea. So essentially, if I didn't mention it last time, the plan is that I've had on my mind to have an ESP32 control my lights down here in the workshop. And I want to do it through a web interface. And I want it to have, you know, software toggles on a website. I want the ESP to host a website where I'll have software toggles to turn on and off my lights. And maybe I can hook up to my PC, can turn on my PC, off my PC, that kind of thing in the long run. And uh, so the, the plan is because it was, it's very hard to do those kinds of things live on stream where I like to do most of my sort of like difficult, my, like my coding work, the stuff that I have to look up and whatever. You can't really do that on stream because you need your Wi-Fi credentials in plain text in the code. So I thought I'd make an interesting video of rounding up all of the free AI services and using them to write and refine code to make it happen. So essentially, you know, if you run out, let, let's say you use ChatGPT, you ask ChatGPT to spit out the code. But then when you get to a certain point, GPT-4.0 runs out and you drop down to the, to the worst GPT, GPT-3.5. But the video will be to take the output of ChatGPT and either refine the whole thing or refine parts of it with another AI, like Claude.ai. And I've discovered there's quite a few AIs out there you can use. So first of all, there's Bing Chat. Um, which is only four replies, but still useful. There's Claude.ai. There is ChatGPT. There is Google Gemini. There is uh, Microsoft's Copilot. I don't really know how to access that one yet. But there's also local GPTs. So you can run a piece of software called GPT for All, which you can then input uh, LLMs and you can use that, but I find they're not as good as uh, ChatGPT, for example. So I can use all of these tools in a combination to try to output, you know, some decent code. And uh, if I can swing it, I might want to send the code to some of the people I know who do code, and they can review it and see if, uh, you know, if I wrote some good code type thing. So. That is that is a plan for that, and um, I'm I love to get cracking on that pretty soon because the way the these AIs work is that once you get locked out, you used enough of their premium stuff for free, you only get locked out for like twelve hours or so. So then the next day you can take the, your code that it was spit out, and you could you know take like a section like a function and say hey refine this make this better, and then they could just work it over and over and over. And I want to see if you know. I come up with something usable. So that would be the plan on that one. So yeah, I think I'm going to end this here and uh, do some editing and uh, head to sleep. So I'll catch you guys on the next one. Same bad time, same bad channel. Thanks for listening, folks.